Well, welcome back to episode 13 of Math 1050 College Algebra. I'm Dennis Allison and I teach here at UVSC in the Mathematics Department. Uh, episode 13 is actually the first half of uh, two episodes that are related, both dealing with rational functions. So you'll, you'll see this discussion continued in episode 14. Um, rational functions are functions that are ratios of two polynomials. So, for example, if we, go to the, if we go to the objectives for the course, we'll be graphing a function like f of x equals 1 over x. That's a ratio of two polynomials. We can think of one as being a constant polynomial over a linear polynomial x. And we'll also be graphing g of x equals 1 over x squared. We'll also talk about what do we mean by asymptotes, vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Then we'll be making transformations of our, of our two uh, original rational functions. And then we'll look at some applications uh, of these functions. Uh, now, when I say a rational function, what I mean is a function of this form, f of x equals, um, and then on the top, in the numerator, I put a polynomial, and in the denominator, I put a polynomial. So we'll call them uh, p of x and q of x. As an example, we could have f of x equals um, x plus 1 over uh, x squared uh, plus 2x minus 3, for example. That would be um, it, one example of a, of a little bit more complicated uh, rational function. Now, the two rational functions that we want to consider today, the two, the two that we had listed on the screen, were f of x equals x squared, uh, excuse me, f of x equals 1 over x, and the other one is g of x equals 1 over uh, x squared. Now, these two functions are going to be added to our list of fundamental uh, functions that we will be translating up and down, left and right, we'll be stretching, we'll be inverting, and so forth, like we did some other functions. What were the other fundamental functions that we've considered so far in this course? What was one of them? Y equals X. Y equals X, okay, or we'll say F of X equals X. So let me just list those right below here. There was F of X equals X, that was a linear function. What was another one? f of x equals x squared. f of x equals x squared, that was a parabola, yeah. And um, remember, there were three target points for each one of those functions. What was another one we've had, Matt? f of x equals the absolute value of x. The absolute value function, and there were three target points for that one that we considered early on. Ginny? And f of x equals the square root of x. f of x equals the square root of x, yeah, the square root of x. Now, what was different about the target points for the square root of x? No negatives. Uh, yeah, there, there were no negative values allowed, so there only two target points. Uh, there were still four others, though. Anybody remember another one that we've had? f of x equals x cubed. Uh, f of x equals x cubed, exactly. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a function that we said at one time was called a higher order parabola, uh, or, or a higher parabola, because it, it does sort of come down like a parabola, a little bit steeper, a little bit flatter as you approach the origin, but then it hooks down in the third quadrant. Uh, and there were three others. Anybody remember any others? f of x equals the cube root of x. Yeah, the cube root, exactly. So just like we had the square root, there was the cube root function, uh, which had three target points. It looks very much like the cubic function, except it comes in sideways and goes across, rather than coming down in the first quadrant into the third quadrant. Uh, there was also a constant function, f of x equals a constant. That one's so basic, it's almost hard to think of it as being, uh, being much to graph. What do constant... Yeah, what, what do constant functions generally look like if you graph them? A straight line. A uh, straight line. In fact, what kind of straight line? Horizontal. Horizontal straight line, exactly. And then there's the greatest integer function. That's the most mysterious one of all. Uh, and the way we wrote that was to put square brackets on the x like that. Although in your textbook, you may see it written with a square bracket and an extra bar in there. And um, the reason I write it both ways is because on my word processor, when I type up problems, I don't have that double bar, uh, so I usually just use the square bracket when I represent it. What makes this function different from all the others is this one has discontinuities. You have jumps. You have these uh, horizontal branches, these little steps that, that keep ascending as you go from left to right. So that makes it a little different because uh, uh, not all the pieces are uh, connected, so it's not continuous, as they say. Well, to add to this list of eight functions, I want to add these two other functions, 1 over x and 1 over x squared, and let's see what these look like, because they're very useful in various applications of college algebra. And we'll look at some of those applications, by the way, before this episode is over. Well, I've never graphed f of x equals 1 over x before in this course, 
So as we would with any function that we haven't graphed before, I would make a table of values and plot points. But of course, that's sort of a, a primitive and a rather tedious way of graphing a function. So what we want to do is look for some target points that we could graph, and then we want to, we want to uh, keep the shape in mind so we can sketch it more quickly. Um, let's see. Let's put our table over here on the side. I'll put uh, x, and then I'll put f of x, or, or y on the right. Uh, suppose I were to choose 1, 2, 3, 4 for x. What would be f at 1 for this function? 1. Would be 1. 1 over 1. 1 over 1 is 1. Uh, what would I get if I substitute in 2? 1 half. 1 half, exactly. And for 3, it would be uh, 1 over 3, so 1 third. And for 4, it's 1 over 4. So you notice that as the x gets bigger, the function value gets smaller because it's going to be 1 over that. Um, what if I were to substitute in a negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, say negative 4? Um, what would be f of negative 1? Negative 1. Negative 1 because it's 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. And uh, for negative 2, it's 1 over negative 2, or negative 1 half. And the, for negative 3, I think we'll get negative 1 third. And for negative 4, we'll get negative 1 fourth. Uh, let's see, what number, what integer have I, have I sort of carefully avoided here? Zero. zero. Zero, yeah, you might say, well, Dennis, what about zero? What happens if you substitute in a zero right here? It's undefined. You, you can't divide by zero, so there's no answer. So what that means is zero is not in the domain of this function. This function has domain um, all real numbers except zero. So I'm really not allowed to choose x because it's not in the domain. Well, let's plot the values that we have so far. We have quite a few of them there. Uh, so I'll just make my graph out here uh, in this open space. And here's the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. Uh, so one of the ordered pairs I'll plot will be the point 1, 1. And then I'll also locate the point 2, 1 half. 2, 1 half will be right about there. 3, 1 third. Well, it's kind of hard to show that that's 1 third, but we'll guess it's about there. And 4, 1 fourth. So it looks like these points, as I connect them, are approaching the x-axis. And the further out I go, the bigger the x, the smaller the function value. So this approaches the x-axis, but it will never actually touch the x-axis because 1 over x will never be 0. My function value will never be 0, but I can get as close to 0 as I wish. For example, if I substitute in 1,000, 1 over 1,000, I'd be, I'd be so close to the x-axis you probably couldn't tell the difference when I graph it, but it's, it's not quite touching the x-axis. Over on the other side, we have negative 1, negative 1. That comes from this ordered pair right here. We have negative 2, negative 1 half. We have negative 3, negative 1 third. Negative 4, negative 1 fourth. And you see the same thing's happening over here, but I'm approaching the x-axis from underneath. Now, what we don't have is what happens in between here. So let me go back and add some other values to my table but I'm going to choose numbers close to 0, but not exactly 0. Uh, suppose, for example, we choose x to be 1 half, or 1 third, or 1 fourth. So 1 half, right about here, 1 third, right about there, 1 fourth, right about there. Um, if I substitute in 1 half for x, we get 1 over a half. And what does that reduce to? Yeah. That's 2, yeah, if we invert and multiply. And 1 over 1 third is 3. And 1 over 1 fourth is 4. So at 1 half, I go up to 2. At 1 third, I go up to 3. And at 1 fourth, I go up to 4. So you, you see, we have just the opposite effect as my x's get close to 0. Instead of my function approaching the x-axis, they actually turn away from the x-axis, and they start approaching but never quite touch the y-axis. Now, of course, if it ever actually crossed the y-axis, I'd have a function value at 0, and we know that 0 is not in the domain. So I'm approaching the y-axis and uh, coming up from the, from the right-hand side, 
And if I were to substitute in minus a half, minus one third, minus one fourth, so that I choose values over on this side, minus a half, minus a third, minus a fourth, I would get negative two, negative three, and negative four. Plotting those points at negative a half, negative two, at negative one third, negative three, and at negative one fourth, negative four. So my graph curls down on this side. Now, these two portions of the graph are called the branches. I have the first quadrant branch and the third quadrant branch of the function 1 over x. And this function has something in common with the greatest integer function that we saw earlier in the semester, and that is that it has some disconnected pieces. And at the moment that my graph jumps from uh, the lower branch to the upper branch, I'd call that a discontinuity because it isn't connected there. Uh, just like in the greatest integer function, I had lots of discontinuities where we jumped to each level uh, of the graph. Uh, now, we have names for the x-axis and the y-axis uh, in the sense that the curve is approaching the axis, but it never quite touches it. The x-axis here for this graph is a horizontal asymptote is the term we use. It's a horizontal asymptote. And what I mean by an asymptote is it is a, it is a it is a line that the curve approaches as I go out to infinity, but it never quite touches. Uh, can we go to the uh, second graphic in our list there, the one titled asymptotes? <coughs> there we go. It says when a graph approaches a horizontal line at infinity, either plus or minus infinity, we call the line a horizontal asymptote. And when it approaches a vertical line at a vertical line like x equals a, then that line is called a vertical asymptote. Well, back on this graph, uh, x equals 0, which is the y-axis, x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote. Now, the word asymptote is a rather unusual term, but it comes from Greek, and uh, A-S-Y-M-P-T-O-T-E. So I have a horizontal and a vertical asymptote. Now, as we will find out in the next episode, it's actually possible for a graph not this graph, but some later rational functions, to cross the horizontal asymptote. For example, this one may go across the x-axis and then come back to it and approach it from underneath because it's only at infinity that, uh, that we consider it an asymptote, that the, that the curve approaches the asymptote at infinity. Okay, now, next time I graph 1 over x, I don't want to go to all this trouble. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I want to do is decide on some target points so that I can graph this more quickly. What would you choose for target points in this function? 1, 1. 1, 1, right here. Yeah, there's the point 1, 1. And what else? Negative 1, negative 1. Negative 1, negative 1. Now, if we just keep those two points in mind and locate those points and remember the shape, then we can graph 1 over x uh, quickly in the future. So here's how I would graph it uh, the next time it comes up. If I want to graph the function f of x equals 1 over x, I would uh, locate those two target points. Uh, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1, but not 0, 0, because 0 is not in the domain of the function. And then I would remember that the function turns up and approaches the y-axis, and it turns out and approaches the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote. On the other side, it turns and approaches the x-axis from underneath, and it approaches the y-axis going down from the, uh, from the left-hand side. Now, this isn't a perfectly accurate sketch of the function, but it certainly is a lot quicker. And we're never going to get a perfect sketch of the function, but, uh, but we can try to save time, so this is how we'll graph it in the future. The, uh, the other uh, rational function that we consider a fundamental rational function is um, f of x, I think we called it g of x a moment ago, g of x equals 1 over x squared. Uh, once again, you notice that the domain of this function is all real numbers except 0. All real numbers except 0. Now, to graph this one, if I make a table of values this one time, I'll substitute in 1, 2, 3, 4. And what would the function value at 1 be? 
One. one. It'll be one. How about at two? One-fourth. One-fourth, yeah. It gets getting smaller faster. At three, it's... One-ninth. One, one over nine. And four, it's... One, one six over sixteen. One over sixteen. Okay, and let's do negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Uh, let's see, when I square these numbers, I'm going to get positive answers. So I get the same results. One, one-fourth, one-ninth, and one-sixteenth. So, this time when I graph them, Uh, we have the point 1, 1. I bet we'll want to pick that as a target point. At 2, we go up 1 fourth. What did we go up uh, for the previous function at 2? 1 half. The y-coordinate was 1 half. Now it's 1 fourth. So this one's getting closer faster. At 3, it's 1 ninth. I can hardly tell the difference between that point and the point on the x-axis. And at 4, it's 1 sixteenth. So this curve approaches a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. But uh, although it's difficult to show it as, as, a, as a different uh, approach, it approaches more quickly. On the other side, at negative 1, the function value was 1. That came from right here, negative 1, 1. And at negative 2, we get 1 fourth. And at negative 3, we get 1 ninth. And at negative 4, we get 1 sixteenth. So I get the same sort of thing happening over here. Now, on the other hand, there's a little bit of a difference in what's happening as I approach the y-axis. For one thing, it looks like both pieces are going up, both branches, rather than one going up and one going down. I'll just make a table to uh, represent some other values that are more specific there. There's x and there's g of x. What if I were to choose, well, actually, what if I were to choose either plus or minus a half? Either plus a half or minus a half. I think I'm going to get the same result either way. It'll be 1 over 1 fourth, because we're going to square the x, and that's 4. What if I choose plus or minus 1 third? One. We get 9. And plus or minus 1 fourth, we get 16. Now, look what happens. Uh, at 1 half, I go up to 4. At 1 third, I go up to 9. That's going to take me way off the graph. And at 1 fourth, I go up to 16, way off the graph. So if I draw this graph, it's going to turn up very rapidly. Let's see. I, in fact, I need to turn it even faster than that. It's going to turn more rapidly, and it's going to go right through this point, which was 1 half and 4. And on the other side, at negative 1 half, 4, it's going to turn and go up there. So I, I think if we were to compare 1 over x and 1 over x squared, we would say that 1 over x squared approaches the horizontal asymptote even faster than 1 over x did but it approaches the vertical asymptote even s uh, more slowly than 1 over x did. 1 over x, if you remember at 1 half, we were at 2. Now we're at 4. So 1 over x is actually closer to the y-axis than 1 over x squared is. But once again, I have a horizontal asymptote that's the x-axis, and I have a vertical asymptote that's the y-axis. OK, um, just curious, can you guess what a graph of this next function would look like? I'll call it capital F of x. 1 over x cubed. What do you think, uh, how do you think we would graph that, Stephen? It would look a lot like 1 over <coughs> x, only it would be uh, a sin steeper and quicker. Exactly, yeah. Uh, same target points as 1 over x. 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1. But uh, as you approach the x-axis, it approaches it even faster, even faster than 1 over x squared did. And out here, it's difficult to tell that it's actually above the x-axis and not on the x-axis. But it goes up even faster, and it does approach the y-axis, but it approaches the y-axis more slowly than 1 over x or 1 over x squared did. For example, at 1 half, you'd go up to 8 to get onto the graph. And on the other side, my graph approaches the x-axis from underneath, even more quickly than 1 over x or 1 over x squared did. And it would descend and approach the y-axis um, even more slowly, but it still approaches it. So in other words, as this power gets bigger, these, these two branches have more of an L shape to it and not so much of a curve going through the point 1, 1. Okay, and if I were going to graph 1 over x to the fourth, 
I think I'd put two target points up above the x-axis and both branches would turn up very quickly and they would lay out almost on the x-axis, on the horizontal x-axis, uh, uh, even more dramatically than what we saw before. You know, when I was talking about the graph of um, g of x equals 1 over x squared, I didn't show you how I would graph it quickly in the future using target points, so let me just mention that. For 1 over x squared, I would choose the target points uh, 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. And I would draw my graph coming down like this through this point, and I would have it approach the x-axis relatively quickly. It's kind of hard to show that accurately. And this one comes down and approaches the horizontal asymptote over here rather quickly. And that's a, that's a rough sketch of 1 over x squared. Okay, uh, let's go to the next uh, graphic on transformations of rational functions. And uh, let's consider these examples. It says, sketch the following graphs by locating target points. Do not make a table of values. That is not, not to plot random points, but just use the target points. Let's first try graphing f of x equals 3 minus 1 over x, and then let's try graphing uh, g of s equals 2 over s plus 3. Now these are both variations of the function 1 over x. So that first one is uh, f of x equals 3 minus 1 over x. Now what I see are two transformations being made on my fundamental graph 1 over x. Uh, if I turn it around, I could say minus 1 over x plus 3. Now, what are, the, what are the transformations I'll need to make in that fundamental graph? Jenny, what do you think? What should we do? It's going to be shifted up to 3 yeah, on the y-axis. We're going to shift it up 3. What else? <coughs> it has a slope of negative 1. Well, let's see, we don't really use the word slope for these curves. We use slopes for straight lines. It's going to be turned but that upside down. Uh, it's going to flip it over, exactly. We're going to have to have to flip the graph over. So when we see 3 minus 1 over x, if that looks confusing, just put it in the form um, where the 3 is added on the right-hand side, and that, that may seem more reasonable as a vertical translation. So when I go to graph this function, here's how I'll do it. Um, We'll get our scaling set up here. And uh, we want to raise the graph three units up. Now, you remember the x-axis was a horizontal asymptote? I'm going to take the horizontal asymptote with me and put it in as a dotted line right here, right through three. Now, that's not actually part of the graph. It's merely an aid in helping me sketch the graph. And then I want to flip my graph over. You notice from my new origin, I would go over 1 and up 1 to my new target point. But when I flip it over, I'll go over 1 and down 1, and I'll have a target point right here. That's actually at the point 1, 2, because I went over 1 and down 1 from my new origin. And uh, the other target point, which would normally have been in the third quadrant when I flip it over, is in the second quadrant. If I go back 1, I'll go up 1. So with those two points alone, I'll draw the graph. It approaches the horizontal asymptote over here, and it approaches the vertical asymptote like, like so. And on the other side, it will approach the vertical asymptote like, um, like that, and it'll approach the horizontal asymptote over here. And it, of course, we're, we're doing this strictly so we can get a rough sketch of the graph, so we're, we're doing this for speed rather than for accuracy. Um, how could I figure out where is that x-intercept right there? y equal to zero. Set y equal to zero. Yeah, let's just do that down here. This is the y coordinate. I'll set that equal to zero, three minus one over x. And that says that one over x is equal to three. Now, if I just invert both sides, the reciprocal of one over x should equal the reciprocal of three. X is one third. So we should be, if this is totally accurate, we should be crossing the x-axis at one third. And that actually looks reasonable. It looks like that could be one third. Uh, where is the y-intercept for this function? It never does. Actually, it never does, you see, because it never does cross the y-axis. But even if you hadn't noticed that, to find the y-intercept, you'd let x be 0. And you see, we can't let x be 0 because our function is undefined. So there is no y-intercept for this function. And we can see that in a number of ways. We can see that by substituting a 0, we get no answer. And we can see that from our original graph, 
we had a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, and therefore we won't be crossing that vertical asymptote. Okay, the other function that was on that uh, list, on that graphic, was um, g of s equals, see, g of s equals two over s plus three. Now, <clears throat> let's see, what have I done that makes it look different? Well, for one thing, I've called the function g rather than f, uh, and I've chosen a variable s rather than x, but that's only cosmetic. Uh, so when I draw my axes, I'll have to label my horizontal axis s. Uh, now, what are the changes that will be made in the fundamental graph 1 over s? Well, let's see, there's a 2 in the numerator, and you know, I could bring that 2 out in front and call this 1 over s plus 3. What does a 2 in front, a multiplier by 2, what does that do to the graph? It's a map. It stretches it? It's going to stretch it, yeah. It's going to stretch it vertically and horizontally away from the x-axis. So this is a stretch. And what is the plus 3, s plus 3, what's that going to do to the graph? Matt? Move it uh, 3 units to the left. To the left, yeah. That, that's always a tricky one. You see a plus 3, you want to move it in the positive direction, but it moves it in a negative direction. If I might just remind you over here on the side, if you remember when we were graphing the parabola, uh, x plus 3 squared, that parabola was shifted over 3 units to negative 3, and then that parabola went up like that. So, um, and the, the, re the reason we explained uh, that it had its vertex at negative 3 is because this square is 0 whenever the quantity inside is 0, and the quantity inside is 0 when x is negative 3. So at negative 3, that's when I get function value 0. Now, in this case, I want to shift this graph to the left 3. So here's negative 3 right here. And that means my vertical asymptote is going to be moved over 3 units. And I'll put my vertical asymptote here. Or if you would like a different explanation, when is this function undefined? This function is undefined if I substitute in negative 3 for s. So that's where my vertical asymptote should be, not at plus 3, but at minus 3. OK, now I locate target points. This is basically going to be the graph of 1 over s. So I'll go over 1 and up 1, but there's a stretch. So when I go over 1, I go up 2. So I go up to 2 units for that target point. And if I go back 1, I go down 2, and I get a target point right there. Now, this function has a graph then that looks like, looks like this. And on the other side, Let's take out that parabola, because we could use the space now. Uh, in this case, my parabola curls down this way, and it approaches the horizontal asymptote over here. And now, when you draw this, you may draw this where it curves out a little slower, or you may draw it where it curls out a little faster. I any, of those, uh, any of those sketches would be fine with me. Because, like we've said many times, this is just for, to get a general shape of the graph. Um, is there an x-intercept for this function? No. No, there's not. Is there a y-intercept? Yes. Yes, there is. Sam, how would you find the y-intercept for that function? You put a zero in. Okay. So, to find the y-intercept, I guess we'll call that the y-axis whenever to label it, uh, what you do is you let uh, s be zero. And if I substitute in a 0, we do get an answer. We get 2 over 0 plus 3, which is 2 thirds. So this number right here, or this point, should be the point 0 and 2 thirds. And that looks just about right. It's uh, about 2 thirds. OK, um, let me make up a couple more functions like this, variations of fundamental functions. And um, I want you to tell me how I should go about graphing them. What if I were to graph, um, <clears throat> let's say, f of x equals uh, minus 1 over x minus 2 squared? I want to sketch that function. Now, you know, if you stop and think about it, before we started this lesson today, if you had been asked to graph this, probably the only thing you could think of would be to do would be to make a table of values. And we know that that's slow and tedious. But now we can graph this rather quickly. What's the fundamental graph that I'm going to be uh, drawing here? 
1 over x squared. Yeah, OK, so over here we're thinking. Yeah, so we're, we're thinking, we're thinking of, uh, oh yes, we're thinking of f of x equals 1 over x squared. But it's not going to look exactly like that. What are the changes that we'll make on this? Uh, Flip it over. Right, it's going to be flipped over because of the negative 1, because you can think of that as a negative 1 coefficient. Move to the right, right and, two. and move it to the right, too. Okay, so if you think of those two changes, let's see if we can do that all at once in our fundamental graph. You see, this actually gives us power to draw a wide variety of functions that we before would have thought would have been very tedious to, to uh, graph. I don't know if you find this terribly exciting. This may seem tedious, too, but it's certainly not as tedious as making a table of values. Uh, okay, so we're going to move it over two units to the right. So that means my vertical asymptote is going to move over two to the right. So that's going to be the line x equals two right there. And uh, the target points, let's see. Um, who can help me with the target points? What should I do? Go to the right one and then what? Down one. Down one. Down one. And uh, let's see, Jenny, why did you say go down one? Because on the normal graph, one over x squared, you would went up one, but since you're turning this upside down. Right. We've, we flipped this over, so now we go down one. And when you go to the left one, what do you do? Down one. Up one. Down we go down one again, because see, this is one over x squared, and both of its target points normally would have gone over one and up one, but we flipped it over, so they both go down. And therefore, this graph looks like, uh, looks like this. Okay, so that, wasn't, that wasn't, didn't take us very long to graph that one at all. And that's the graph of f of x equals negative 1 over x minus 2 squared. Now, you know, in applications uh, of uh, graphing techniques to business, to physics, to engineering, to other courses, uh, some of the key values are to know where's the vertical asymptote. Okay, that's at x equals 2. Where's the horizontal asymptote? That's at y equals 0. The x-axis, y equals 0, is the horizontal asymptote. Uh, where are the intercepts? Well, this one has no x-intercept, but it does have a y-intercept. Can anyone name the y-intercept, by the way? Will it be one, negative 1 half? Uh, no, close. Let's see. We'd have to substitute in a 0. That would be negative 1 over negative 2 squared. So it would be what? Negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth. So the y-intercept is at 0 negative one-fourth, because we, we have to square that, of course. Uh, so we found the y-intercept right there, where it crosses the y-axis. And these are the, these are the values that are the most significant values. The horizontal asymptote, the vertical asymptote, the y-intercept, the x-intercepts, if there are any x-intercepts, weren't in this case. The target points only because they help us to draw the graph. Uh, and you might say, well, now, Dennis, why is the y-intercept, let's say, a significant point uh, in a graph, why is it more significant than, say, what's the value over here at 5? Well, you see, if this were a business application, and if my horizontal axis represented time, then this value would be the value at t equals 0 at the moment that we're beginning the problem, you might say, where the problem is turned on. Let's say we have a company and we're starting up, or we're, we're, we're starting production of a new, of a new, uh, uh, of a new item, and this might represent the startup costs. So initially, before we make any items, this is how much we spend to start up. And as we begin to make more items, it begins to cost us more. Uh, and it looks like, in this case, the function never, never turns around. Even after you go after past the asymptote to the other side, we still have negative expenses, but we're coming back towards zero. So if this, were, if this represented the, um, the, uh, the uh, profits, let's say, of a company, this company never has a, a positive profit. But that would be the startup cost right there. OK. So did it have negative infinity for Yeah, it looks profits. like it'd go to infinity. So that really wouldn't have much of an application for a business. It wouldn't go to infinity. But um, uh, in other words, there are physical interpretations uh, to, um, uh, to these applied problems to what various points might, might be. Uh, let's take another function. How about this one? g of x equals. Um, um, 1 over 2 times x minus 3 squared minus, um, let's say, minus 1. Now, you see, the, what makes it different, among other things, is I put a 2 in the bottom, not on the top. Can anyone explain how we're going to uh, justify 
that this is a fundamental graph with a transforma several transformations made on it? Just put it out of brackets in a half. Put a one half out in front. Yeah, put a one half out in front. And this is one over x minus three squared. And then put the minus one outside. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what is the one half going to do to the graph? Compress it. It's going to compress it, yeah. So here we have a compression. Here we have a shift to the right, 3. And what does the minus 1 do? Move it down 1 on the y-axis. Yeah, it's going to move it down 1. Let's see if we can accommodate all those changes. So um, we'll get this set up to graph. We said we're going to move it over 3 to the right. So I'm going to take my vertical asymptote, move it over 3 to the right, and put it right here. This is the line x equals 3. And we said the horizontal asymptote is going to be moved down 1. In fact, the entire graph is going to be moved down 1. So my horizontal asymptote is the x-axis. I move it down 1, and I'll put in a dotted line here. Now, as I was saying earlier, these asymptotes are not an official part of the graph. They're merely an aid in helping me sketch the graph. So when I draw the graph, I could just as easily wipe out the asymptotes, take the asymptotes out, and the graph would still remain. So this is my new origin. Uh, and this was originally 1 over x squared before we started uh, fooling around with it. So if I go over 1, I would normally go up 1, but now I go up a half because it's been compressed. And if I go to the left 1, I go up a half because it's been compressed. And so now when I draw my graph, I have it come down, go through this point, and then it approaches very quickly the horizontal asymptote. And on the other side, I have it come down and approach very quickly the horizontal asymptote. As a matter of fact, over here, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the graph and the asymptote if we could really zoom in on it. Um, so this is our graph. How many x-intercepts do we have? Two. Looks like we have two. How could I figure out what they are? Set y equal to zero. Set y equal to zero, OK? So if I set y equal to zero, this is to get the x-intercepts, I'll say 0 equals 1 over 2 times x minus 3 squared minus 1. That says that 1 is equal to 1 over 2 times x minus 3 squared. Then if I multiply both sides by 2 times x minus 3 squared, I have 2 times x minus 3 squared equals 1. So if I divide by 2, x minus 3 squared is 1 half. Let's just make a little room here so we can continue. Now, if I take a square root, x minus 3 will be, will equal uh, plus or minus the square root of a half. Okay, now here's where we, remember in the very first episode we talked about uh, rules for simplifying radicals. This is not simplified in the official sense because I have a fraction under the radical. So what would be a better way to write that? Square root of 2 over 2. Uh, well, yeah, actually, let me, let me fill in a step. The square root of 1 over the square root of 2, and then if you multiply by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2, we'll have Jenny's answer. So x minus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. And therefore, x is equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. So can anyone tell me what this x-intercept is right there, what that number is? 3 plus root 2 over 2? 3 plus the square root of 2 over 2. And if we're going to make it a point, I'll put a 0 on the end. And so you see, this number is slightly more than 3. That makes sense because 3 is where the asymptote is. And the x-intercept on this side is 3 minus the square root of 2 over 2, 0. Uh, so I, we do have two x-intercepts, and we were able to calculate both of them. And to get the y-intercept, we let x be 0. I think we can do that in this space. If I let x equal 0, what would be the g value? That would be 1 over 2 times negative 3 squared minus 1. Can anyone simplify that for us? I'm running out of room here, so I need you to work that out for me in your head. How much will that be? Isn't it 1 over 18? 1 over 18 minus 18 over 18. Minus 17 over 18. Yeah, minus 17 over 18. That's almost negative 1. And you see, that is the y-intercept right there at uh, this point would be 0 
negative 17 eighteenths. Not a pretty number at all, but that's the value. Hey, we didn't say rational numbers, rational functions were pretty, but, uh, but we can sketch them nonetheless. Okay, um, now let's go to the next graphic. And we'll see here graphs of two rational functions. And the question that I ask you is what is the rule, what is the function rule for each one of these rational functions? In part A, there's no horizontal asymptote, but if it were drawn in, what do you think the horizontal asymptote would be? it'd be uh, y equals 1. And there's no vertical asymptote shown, but what do you think if it were drawn in, where would it be? Negative 2. x equals negative 2. Yeah, so if you imagine that those horizontal and vertical asymptotes are drawn, what rule does this function have? Uh, let's say we call this function f, f of x equals. Now, we want to move it uh, two units to the left, so how would the rule begin? 1 over x. 1 over x plus 2. Now, is that 1 over x plus 2 squared or squared. just squared? Yeah, because you notice on both sides of the asymptote, we're going down. Uh, it looks like that graph has been flipped over, so what else do we need to do to this? Negative. Put a negative on it. And let's go back to that graphic screen so that everyone at home can see what we're doing. Uh, what's one more change I need to make in this plus one, looks like we need to go up one, plus one. So if you come back to the green screen, I think this is the function, the function rule for the first function that was graphed there. Negative one over x plus two squared plus one. You know, if you look on the website, you'll see these very same graphs and you'll see answers to these, uh, to these uh, questions that I'm asking you on the website. So if you're not copying this down quite fast enough, I think you'll, you'll get what you need from the website. Okay, let's go back to that graph. You can look at the second function graph there. Now, in this second graph, uh, you notice there are two target points plotted. It looks like they're at 1, 1 half, and negative 1, negative 1 half. And the question that we're being asked there is, what is the rule for that function? Um, well, would you say this is a variation of 1 over x or 1 over x squared in part b? 1 over x. 1 over x. What modification have we made to the graph? We've compressed it, so how should I change the equation g of x equals 1 over x? g of x equals 1 half. Yeah, I would have to guess here. It looks like that's about 1 half. So I would say if we come to the green screen, this is going to be 1 half times 1 over x. There are no horizontal or vertical transformations being made. So I think what we saw there was the graph of 1 over 2x. That's all there is to it. Um, so we have this rule for function A, for the graph in A, and we have this rule for the graph in B. Okay, now, you know what? When you come to rational functions, the author can do a number of things to try to hide what the transformations are. Let me give you an example. Uh, in fact, let's go to the next graphic, and I think we'll see an example. Uh, improper rational functions. Now, a rational function whose numerator has a degree as large or larger than that of the denominator is an improper rational function. So I ask you this question, how can we graph the improper rational function f of x equals x plus one, uh, x minus one over x minus two? And where would you begin to graph this? Well, let's come to the green screen and take a look at that. We have f of x equals x minus one over x minus two. And if I told you that this is actually a mere transformation of one over x or one over x squared, you may not at first think it is because we have this, uh, this, we have two polynomials, both of them are first degree, but this is called an improper rational expression because I have the same degree on top as on bottom. So what I'm gonna do is to divide the bottom denominator expression into the numerator. Now I suppose I could use synthetic division to do this, but this is so short, I don't think it's gonna take much time any way I approach it. If I divide x minus two into x minus one, x goes into x one time. And when I multiply that out, I get x minus 2, and I need to subtract that off just using ordinary long division. So when I subtract x minus x, I get 0. Minus 1, subtract negative 2, what will I get there? One. We get a 1 there. That's my remainder. I'll add that on as a fraction added on at the end. So this is the same thing as 1 plus 1 over x minus 2. Well, you see, we may not have recognized the graph in this form, 
but I think we do recognize the graph in this form, and they're one and the same. So if I graph this, um, this improper rational expression, it's the same thing as graphing this proper rational expression plus one. So if I want to graph function f, uh, I'll just graph the expression over here because this looks simpler for me to graph. It's the very same thing as what we had there. So um, what, what transformations would I make in the graph of 1 over x? Move to the right 2 and down 1. Move to the right 2. Okay, so I'm going to put my, my vertical asymptote there. This is at x equals 2. That's an asymptote, so I better put some spaces in there. And you said move it up 1? So if I move it up 1, okay, this would be y equals 1. And here, of course, is x equals 2. Um, there are no stretches or compressions. There's no, there's no reflection. So if I go over and up 1, I get a point there. If I go back and down 1, I get a point right here on the x-axis. And here is my graph. And we have just graphed here f of x equals x minus 1 over x minus 2. Now you see, when you, when, you look at this, when, you, when you look at this rule, it's not so obvious that the graph is merely a transformation of 1 over x. Uh, it's not until you carry out the long division that you realize that this function can be written in that form that we realize how we're going to graph it. So the author can try to hide an, uh, a function like this by expressing it in this form. Now, you know what? When I say an author can hide it, of course, that holds for the instructor as well. The instructor can hide the function by writing it in this form. So let me give you an example of a function that you might see, say, for example, on a test or on a quiz or homework. Um, I'm going to call it g of x. And suppose the function is um, x times x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now, at first glance, you might think, my gosh, this is a very complex problem to, uh, to, uh, to graph. But I think if I use long division, it's not so bad at all. I'm going to divide the bottom into the top. But I'm going to multiply out the numerator first before I do it. x squared plus 2x over x squared plus 2x plus 1. So I'll divide the denominator into the numerator. How many times will x squared go in x squared? One time. I'll put a 1 over there. So I have x squared plus 2x plus 1, and I have to subtract that off. Uh, the x squares cancel. The 2x's cancel. What do I get here? Negative 1. Negative 1. And I can no longer divide the divisor into negative 1. So I get this remainder. What that tells me is I'm kind of running out of space here, is that this is going to be 1 plus negative 1 over x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now, those of you at home and those of you right here in the studio may say, well, gee, Dennis, I'm not sure how to graph this either. Well, I don't think we've quite finished with it. How can I factor this denominator? x plus 1 squared. That's x plus 1 squared. So what I, I'm going to make several changes here. I'm going to write minus 1 over x plus 1 squared. And then the 1 that's in front, I'm going to put in the back. Now, you see, g of x can be represented this way, g of x can be represented that way, g of x can be represented as this um, constant plus a proper fraction, and finally, g of x can be represented this way. Now, this is the one that tells me how to draw the graph. Uh, this is basically the graph of g of x equals 1 over x squared, with a few modifications made. Um, I'm going to be moving it up one. I'm going to be moving it to the left one, and I'm going to be inverting it. So here we go. We are now going to graph this function that seemed so complicated originally. Let's get our scale set up. Here's the x-axis. So uh, we're going to move our graph to the left one. So I'll put a vertical asymptote at negative 1. That's the line, x equals negative 1. We're going to move the graph up 1, so the horizontal asymptote comes up 1. Um, so here's my new origin. I have to invert my graph, so when I go over 1, I'll go down 1. And from the new origin, I'll go to the left 1 and go down 1. 
and my graph looks like this. Um, I'm not being too careful here how I graph it. It's just the general shape that we want. Some of you at home may say, gee, Dennis, you know, you say your graph isn't very good, but when we draw them, ours don't even look quite that good. What I'm, what I'm going to be looking for are the general features of the graph, so it doesn't have to be, this isn't an art course, and I'm obviously not an artist, but um, I'm looking for the, the general idea. Uh, what are the two x-intercepts here? Zero and negative two. And look what happens. If I were to set this equal to zero, that would mean the numerator would be zero. And if the numerator were zero, the solutions would be zero and negative two. So I do have those two x-intercepts. What is the y-intercept? Well, the y-intercept where it crosses the y-axis is at zero. And I think if you substitute in zero for x there and there and there and there, you get zero over one. So the y-intercept would be zero. And so this is the graph of the function g of x equals x times x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now, we didn't do that in, say, 30 seconds. It took longer than that. But prior to this discussion in this episode, I think we would have had a lot of difficulty in drawing a graph of that at all. OK, well, now you see that we have two new fundamental functions, uh, f of x equals 1 over x and g of x equals 1 over x squared. So if you add that to our list, I guess now we have 10 fundamental functions, and we can graph infinitely many variations of those. You might say, well, what, what makes those fundamental as opposed to, say, other functions that we haven't talked about? Well, these are the functions that come up most often in applications in other courses, absolute value, greatest integer, linear functions, uh, rational functions, 1 over x, 1 over x squared. So what we're trying to do is sort of build, a, build a, a sort of a catalog of functions in our mind that we can sketch quickly and variations of them. Um, let's look at this application, and I'll, and I'll show you how uh, rational functions come up in other problems. Suppose that a drug is being administered to a patient by means of an IV, and the concentration C in the bloodstream after t minutes is given by this formula. The concentration at time t is 20 minus 20 over t plus 1 squared, where C of t is measured in milligrams per liter of blood. Okay, so we have this IV, sort of a drip IV, and a drug is being administered to a patient. And let's say that this function begins at the moment t equals zero. That's when the IV is first introduced. And C of t is the amount of milligrams per liter that's in the blood at, at time t. Now, um, how could I find out what is the initial concentration of the drug in the bloodstream? Let's come to the green screen and I'll, I'll write this function uh, right here. C of t is 20 minus 20 over t plus 1 squared. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first thing I might ask is, what is the initial concentration of the drug uh, in the bloodstream. How would I answer that? Set t equal to zero. Yeah, set, set t equal to zero, because we said we were going to begin this at the moment t equals zero. So what we do is we calculate c at the moment t is zero. So um, that's the value I'll substitute in. And what I get is 20 minus 20 over 0 plus 1 squared. How, what does that reduce to being? We get what? Zero. We get 0. We get 0 milligrams. That's right, because when you first introduce the IV, there is no concentration of drug. There is no drug in the bloodstream at all. So we get 0. Okay, next question. What's the approximate concentration after, uh, let's say, 10 minutes? If T is measured in minutes, C at 10, would be 20 minus 20 over 11 squared, which is 20 minus 20 over 121. Well, let's see. Well, this, this, is, uh, this is roughly 1 sixth. So let's say it's approximately, just to kind of speed this up, it's approximately 20 minus 1 sixth, which would be 19 and 5 sixth milligrams per liter. 
of, of blood. So the concentration has gone from zero up to 19 and 5, 6. Um, what would the graph of this function look like? Whoops, I shouldn't have erased my, my rule. 20 minus 20 over t plus 1 squared. What would the graph of this look like? It well, let's see. Over one. Jenny? It would be shifted up 20. It's okay. going to be shifted up 20, yep. So let's, let's just say this is 20 right here. Yeah, because we have 20 added on in front as opposed to being added on in back, it's added in front. What else? Be inverted. It's going to be inverted because of the negative. What does this do? Moves it to the left one. To the left one. So let's say we go over one right here. This, this is uh, negative one. I'll put a vertical asymptote there. And uh, let's see, starting from a new origin, if I go over one, I go down because it's been inverted. And what's the stretch? 20. 20, yeah, because see, there's a 20 there. So if I go over one, I go down 20, I get a point here. And if I go back one, I get a go down 20 right there. And my graph looks like this. But you know what? I've been graphing this for negative as well as positive values. If I throw away all the negative values, I'm left with this portion of the graph for t greater than or equal to zero. It starts off at concentration zero. That's the concentration axis. It starts off at concentration zero, and it approaches the line 20. Now, if I come out here to um, 10, this altitude should be 19 and 5, 6. And in the long run, what is the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream going to approach? 20. It's going to approach 20 milligrams per liter. So we've been able to draw, uh, draw a graph that is a visual example of this application. Well, let's see, we've introduced uh, two new fundamental graphs. We've looked at transformations of those fundamental graphs, and we've looked at one application sort of hurriedly at the end of the tape. Uh, I'll see you next time for episode uh, 14.